you got the power. powerful eyes. Good morning, everybody. Welcome, welcome. I always have to wait for the lights. That's my cue to start talking. So I always had a little awkward silence before then. Uh, I'm so glad you're here today. This is a, a wonderful Sunday, and uh, my name is Rod Larkins. I lead the music here. And if you're a first-time guest, thank you so much for joining us at our 1030 service. Uh, it's nice to see you all out there. Uh, if you are a first-time guest, we ask you, if you get a chance, take your phone or your tablet and text the word GUEST to the number that you have right on the screen there, 480-933-1482. It's just a way of uh, learning a little about each other, and we'll even send you a digital gift card just to show our appreciation for getting in touch with us. Service is going to last about an hour. We have Pastor Jay Jurjevich, who's going to be delivering the message. We have Pastor Kim Bristol, who's going to be stepping you through offering as well as communion toward the end of the service. And as always, we start with singing. And it feels so good to have some people behind me over here, backing me up here. As I haven't seen them in a while. And uh, so I'd like to go ahead and get started with that. Please stand up and let's start off. Our first song is going to be To God Be the Glory. Glory, great things he has done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened 
last song is one I haven't done in years. How many know that song? Yeah, okay, I heard you singing out there. I know I was an old one. Hey, while you're standing, I want you to take this opportunity to find out who you're sitting next to and worshiping next to, singing next to. So would you just share your name real quickly, somebody right next to you. Just a cottage below, a little silver and a little gold. But in that city where the ransom will shine, I want a gold one that's silver.
Good morning, everybody. How are you all doing today? Good. Great to see you. So uh, I often get asked uh, what it's like to be a pastor. And, uh, you know, obviously there's a many, many different ways I could respond to that question, and I often do. But I want to share with you this morning one of the most awkward things that happens to me as a pastor. And it's the first time that someone realizes that I'm a pastor. And so typically that'll happen when I meet somebody new, like a neighbor or a soccer parent or something like that. And you get to talking, and then eventually, of course, they're going to ask the question, well, what do you do for a living? Right? And, I, and that happens. I get that question. I always take a deep breath because I know what's coming. It's what a friend of mine has, has coined uh, being pastorized, right? Because he's seen this happen over and over again throughout the years. And typically what happens are, are two things. The first thing is that the person will respond and say, oh, kind of just like that. Like at first, the, oh, they're, exci- they're, they're surprised a little bit about the fact that there's a pastor actually walking around in the wild. They don't see that very often. The second, part is, the second part of the oh is like kind of moves into like an oh no, because they start thinking about the conversation that we've had to that point and whether or not they've said anything appropriate, or inappropriate, I should say. In fact, I've had people actually apologize to me for, for, for using profanity in the conversation to that point or whatever it may be, which I find kind of funny. But the second thing that happens is not maybe nearly as funny, uh, but they'll say something like, oh, like that's your full-time job? Like that's... I thought you guys only work on Sundays. And I got to tell you, it takes like every bit of self-control not to respond in a snarky way to that kind of comment. But I, I typically just laugh and explain to them, well, you know, being a pastor, being a church leader is kind of like being a leader in any other organization. Like you care about the organization, you care about the people you're leading and that kind of thing. And so as a result, you're always asking questions about like, what should we be putting our attention towards? What should we be putting our resources towards, right? We've got a budget, we've got staffing issues, we've got kind of church events that we're talking about. And so we're, all, we're always talking and thinking and planning about those things. And of course, we're talking also ultimately about the health of our organization, which means for the church, the spiritual health of our church. Now, I mentioned that this morning because as we turn back to the book of Revelation, we're going to be looking at chapters 2 and 3 in the book of Revelation. And if you're familiar with the book, you may know that these two chapters contain the messages to the seven churches of Revelation. In other words, these were the seven churches who received the book of Revelation during the first century when it was written. They are seven actual churches that existed in seven actual cities in the first century. And so one of the great things about being able to read through a chapter or a couple chapters like this is that we get to see these direct messages that are meant for the church given by Jesus directly to real churches who are experiencing real issues like what we often experience. In other words, they were written to them, but at the same time, they're God's word, so they're applicable to us as well. What I love about this is it's kind of like, think about it this way. It's like as if Jesus would come into, uh, you know, Broadway on Sunday morning, take the mic and say to Broadway Christian Church, these are the great things that are going on among you. These are the things that you need to change. These are the things that, this is how you need to repent. These are the things that are coming. This is how I'm challenging you to grow and those kinds of things. How amazing would it be for Jesus to come in and give a message like that to Broadway Christian Church? How many of us would love to hear that, right? And yet, we've got the next best thing here in these two chapters because we see Jesus' direct words to these seven churches that are still meant for us today. And so we're going to explore that this morning and we're going to take that just as it is. We're going to, I mean, I think the best way to think about these messages is kind of like think about them as smaller versions of the New Testament letters that we have in Scripture. So when we read, for instance, the book of Romans, that was a letter written to the church at Rome, right? We read about that and there's particular things that Paul is calling out. But at the same time, that is applicable to us today. Same thing with like Corinthians or Ephesians or Galatians and just go down the line. Most of the New Testament is made up of these kinds of letters. And so if you think about the messages to Revelation as bite-sized versions of those, it'll, it'll help us really understand how to apply this and what we're supposed to get out of it. And like I say that because I know there's all kinds of different interpretations and applications about these seven churches and, you know, they're applied sometimes to like eras of the history of the church and that kind of thing. Uh, I think in a lot of ways that's speculation. I think we need to approach this in a way that context supports, which is helping us understand how these messages to these churches that really existed in the first century are still applicable to us today, okay? So with that in mind, we're going to consider some context this morning as we begin. First thing we want to talk about is the historical kind of cultural context. And I brought with me the map again of these seven churches just to remind us that again, these are churches that existed in actual cities, but they existed during the first century in an area that was known as Asia Minor. This is a province of Asia Minor 
under the Roman Empire during the first century, which provides us with some important contextual clues. The first thing is this, is that under the Roman Empire at the time, the Roman Empire was governed under what was known as an imperial cult, which meant that the Romans not only believed they had political authority over over their citizens, but they married it with spiritual authority. So they believed they had spiritual authority over their citizens as well, which in a nutshell for Rome meant this. Rome believed that the gods had given the, the, the empire of Rome to humanity as an eternal kingdom that was to be ruled forever. We all know how that ended up, right? There's no more Roman Empire. But at the same time, they also believed that the emperor, the Caesar, was, was godlike and divine in and of himself. So that he was worthy of worship, he was worthy of the devotion that you would give any of the other Roman gods. Now, of course, this created a problem for Christians living under the Roman Empire because they pledged their worship to Jesus alone. And we know that in the Bible, God tells his people over and over again, you shall worship no other gods before me, you shall have no other gods. It goes all the way back to the first commandment in the Old Testament, right? So, but there was a lot of real pressure on the churches to conform, though. Because these weren't only, this wasn't only just an ideology of the Roman Empire, they actually enforced this as law. So that if you didn't participate in the worship festivals and the worship feasts and even sacrifice to Caesar as a citizen under the Roman Empire, you could be punished under the law. So in many cases, you could be arrested, of course. You could be put to death. You could be exiled like John was. John was exiled on the island of Patmos because he had refused to bow down and worship Caesar and because of his Christian faith. Or in many cases, what would happen is that you would just be ostracized from society. You would be prevented from engaging with like buying and selling and trading, which would cause you ultimately to become poor. Stricken with poverty, you wouldn't be able to provide for your family very well. So there were ways that they dealt with people like the Christians who resisted this. Now, you can imagine, given those options, the option of like, the option of just worshiping Jesus versus kind of participating in that whole cultic system, there might be temptation among many of the Christians to just kind of compromise. Like I'll do a little bit here and a little bit there, just enough to make sure that I don't get uh, punished or I don't break the law. And in fact, there were a lot of teachers coming into the church at the time reinforcing that idea, basically telling the Christians, it's okay to worship Jesus in private, and then you can just kind of act like a Roman citizen in the rest of your life. The problem is, is that Jesus has real issues with this. And in fact, this is the context behind why Jesus addresses the churches that, the way that he does. In fact, some of the strongest words that we see Jesus utter directly in the scriptures come from these messages about compromising and about the teaching to compromise. In fact, he says things like, I hate that teaching. I will make war against those who teach that, and I will throw them in the great tribulation. Now, maybe you're asking, why exactly is it that Jesus would be so upset and concerned about these things? Well, let me show you a chart, I brought a chart with me that shows kind of the doctrine of the Roman imperial cult versus the doctrine of the kingdom of God. And I want you to see how much these contrast and fight against each other. I'm not going to read them all, I'm going to read a couple of these. The first one is this. Rome says, the gods have chosen Rome and made it an eternal kingdom. Of course, in Scripture, we know the kingdom of God is the message that Jesus' kingdom is eternal, and he has chosen his church to be his kingdom. Skip down a few lines to where this talks about the Caesar. Rome says this about Caesar. The Caesar himself is worthy of praise, devotion, and allegiance. He is divine incarnate as the Lord, Son of God, and Savior. Notice those titles. Worship and prayers can and should be offered to him. The kingdom of God, of course, Scripture says only Jesus is worthy of worship as the Alpha and the Omega, the Eternal One, the Almighty, the Living One, and Savior. And here's the thing, that in Rome at the time, those ideas, that doctrine was reinforced on a daily basis to those who lived under the Roman Empire. It was reinforced through the famous Roman games, through the coins that were minted, through the parades and festivals and feasts that all citizens were required to take a part in. And these seven churches, by the way, were situated in seven cities that were known as leading worship centers in the Roman Empire. In fact, other than their geography, the thing that they have in common is that they were all recognized throughout the Roman Empire as being worship centers that you could go to and worship the Caesar whenever you wanted to. And so the churches that we're dealing with in these messages face this constant pressure to compromise, 
to compromise with the culture that was around them, to water down their Christian faith in order to follow what they were commanded to do in the culture around them, in the government around them. And they faced real consequences for not doing so. And here's the thing is what this does is this sets up for us a huge theme throughout the book of Revelation. Throughout this entire book, there is this picture of Christians, or this is the, the, there's this image of Christians trying to stay faithful in the midst of all of these temptations to compromise, all of these pressures against their faith to remain faithful to Jesus in the midst of it all. Okay, so this is an important section that sets all this up for us. Um, so we've talked about historical context. Let's talk about the other piece of critical context, which is called literary context. Now, if you remember, literary context is basically we're considering what comes before or after the scripture that we're looking at. How does it connect to what we're reading? And in this case, there's some really important literary context that comes from Revelation chapter 1. And if you were here last week, you saw, you, you heard Pastor John go through this passage, and you may have noticed that in verse 11 in chapter 1, it actually spells out or it says exactly the context and how it connects to these messages. In fact, John is told, write down what you see and, and, and write it and give it to the churches, and he gives the seven names of the churches that are then mentioned in Revelation 2 and 3. Now, what immediately follows that is then what? A vision of who? Of Jesus, Right? And so what we see in that vision is we see Jesus with white hair, or what John sees in that vision is Jesus with white hair, a white robe, a golden sash, burnished bronze for feet, right, and then a two-edged sword coming out of his mouth. And he's called things like the, the, uh, the Alpha and the Omega, the Almighty, the one who was and is and is to come. In other words, he's given all these divi divine names, right? This picture and all this description is highlighting the divinity of Jesus in all of this. And then we're told that Jesus is walking among the seven lampstands. And I think what's important to see here is that we see Jesus in two main roles that he's going to play in the messages that he gives to these churches as well. On the one hand, he is the ultimate prophet. He is the one who is the divine prophet who is speaking God's direct word to these churches in challenging them to remain faithful. And yet he is also the pastor, the good shepherd, who is walking among the lampstands. He is still with them and restoring them and comforting them. He's not shouting it from the clouds. He's down there walking among the lampstands in John's vision. Now, why does this make a difference? Michael Gorman, a theologian, says this about the prophet-pastor role of Jesus. He says, we read Revelation as words from a prophet-pastor in order to be formed and transformed, not merely informed. Because Jesus is both awe-inspiring and present, he can speak words of comfort and challenge, appealing to the church's hearts, their emotions, as well as their minds, their reason. So in doing this, Jesus is going to give seven messages to the seven churches. Each one's a little bit different. Each one focuses on different aspects. But he uses basically a five, kind of five points for each, uh, for each place, for each church. And the points are this. He starts with, he always starts with a picture of himself. So he talks about who he is, and he highlights a different aspect of his character or who he is, and then he moves on to talking to the church about the things that are going well within the church. He identifies the spiritual fruit that's happening there. And then he gives them a warning. In other words, this is what I have against you. This is what I see that uh, needs to change. This is what you need to repent from. And then based on that warning, he gives them a challenge. Challenge. This is what you need to do. And then he finishes it up finally with a promise at the end or an invitation. To he who overcomes or to he who stays faithful, this is the promise that I am giving you, okay? So we're not going to have time, unfortunately, to read through all of those two chapters. They're long couple chapters. But what I want to do, we are going to cover all seven churches in general. I'll show you how we'll do that here in a minute. But I do want to read the first message in Revelation chapter 2 so we get a sense of it in its entirety. All right, so in Revelation chapter 2, the first church that's mentioned is the church at Ephesus. Chapter, chapter 2, verses 1 through 7 says this. To the angel at the church of Ephesus, write this. The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands, I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works that you did at first. 
If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet this you have. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. All right, so it, it helps to be able to group these seven churches together as we talk about them. And I think one of the most effective ways to group them comes from a, a theologian by the name of G.K. Beale, who I've mentioned before. But he groups these by basically the spiritual health of the churches. And so there's two churches, he says, that are basically spiritually flatlined, and we're going to call those the red flag churches. There's three churches who are kind of a mixture of both. They're struggling, but they, there's some great things going on, but they're also struggling in some areas, and Jesus is giving them a caution about something that's going on. We're going to call those the yellow flag churches. And there are two churches who are doing great. In other words, Jesus says nothing but positive things about them. They don't even get a warning. They're just told to stay faithful, and that's the green flag churches, okay? So based on that classification, we just read the message to the church of Ephesus. What do you think the church of Ephesus is? They're, yeah, I heard somebody say red. They're actually, they actually would be classified as a red flag church. And here's the reason. Look, we know, the, we know more about the church of Ephesus than we do about any of these other seven churches. Because if you read through scripture, you know in the book of Acts, Paul, the apostle Paul started the church at Ephesus. Uh, the, the, of course, the book of Ephesians is written to the church of Ephesus. First and second Timothy, Timothy is actually serving as pastor at the church of Ephesus at the time. And so what's being called out here is the fact that Ephesus, at the beginning, had such a great start. They had a fantastic foundation. They were taught doctrinally as well as you could possibly be taught. And in fact, they've kept up that doctrine. They, they you know, I think if they, uh, if they had to go in, you know, in, in a Bible trivia competition against the every, other churches, they'd probably win the Bible trivia competition. Right? They knew doctrine inside and out. The problem is... As Jesus comes to them, he says, I'm the one who holds seven stars, walks among the seven lampstands, seven stars representing uh, the protection, the angelic protection over the churches, seven lampstands, of course, representing the seven churches themselves. And he says, look, I see that you've resisted false teaching and that you know good teaching very well. You know doctrine inside and out. You know scripture inside and out. You've memorized more verses than any other church on the planet. The problem is, and this is a big problem, You've abandoned your first love. That even though you know Scripture so well, you've missed the point of Scripture itself, which is the point to me and fellowship with me. You've abandoned your first love. And so he says to them, remember from where you've fallen. Everything started out great with you. You had a great foundation. You were blessed to have both the Apostle Paul and Timothy at your church. And yet you've fallen from there. And so repent and turn back. And he says, if you do, I will give you the ability, the invitation to eat from the tree of life. That life will be restored to your faith. In other words, for the, for the, for the Ephesians, everything had become head knowledge and nothing was heart knowledge. And as a result, as Jesus says, you're, you're losing your very purpose. He says, I will come and remove your lampstand. Which is a way of saying you're losing your very purpose as a church. So from the church of Ephesus, we move on to the second red flag church, which is the church at Laodicea. Jesus comes to Laodicea as the amen, the faithful, and the true witness. In other words, the one who accomplishes all of his father's purposes, everything faithfully, which is just the opposite, it seems like, of what the church at Laodicea is. Because they have the dubious distinction of being the only church where Jesus says nothing positive about the church. He doesn't identify any fruit whatsoever in that church. Instead, what he says to them is that you are like lukewarm water that I'm ready to spit out of my mouth. In other words, you're not like hot water that's useful for cooking or health or whatever it may be, and you're not like cold water that's useful for drinking. You're like lukewarm water that nobody wants, that's completely useless. And he compares, he uses that analogy to talk about their faith. I mean, imagine that. He, he identifies them as a church that's very materially and financially wealthy. And it might have been in that case that they thought to themselves, well, since we've got so much money and we're so rich, God must love us and God must be blessing us. God must approve of who we are as a church. And yet Jesus comes to them and says, spiritually, you are poor, blind, and naked. And then he says to them, buy spiritual gold and garments from me. Forget about the gold and the garments that you're buying out in the world and all that you've got. Instead, buy spiritual gold and garments from me. 
And then he gives them this wonderful invitation, one that we probably know so well from Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, where he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Anyone who hears me and opens the door, I will come in and dine with them and they with me. In other words, look at this picture. This is a picture of Laodicea having Jesus outside of the church. If you're a church and Jesus is outside your church, that's a bad situation to be in. That's not a good situation to be in as a church. And this is the picture that Jesus presents to him. But even in the midst of that, the church that's furthest away spiritually, basically on spiritual life support, Jesus gives the most tender invitation to. If you hear me and just open the door, I will come in and dine with you. The challenge and the comfort. So from the two red flag churches, we move on to the three yellow flag churches, starting with the church at Pergamum. And Jesus comes to the church at Pergamum as the one who has the sharp two-edged sword, cutting between truth and lies, truth and falsity. And he says to them, the good thing that you are doing is that you're holding fast to the name. In other words, you're holding fast to your Christian faith, to the name of Jesus, in the city that is, host, that is the host of Satan's throne, as Jesus puts it. And here's the thing with Pergamum, is that Pergamum was the first city to build a, um, to build a temple for worship of the emperor in the Roman Empire. And because of that, they got a lot of their identity. They were very proud of that. They got a lot of their identity from the fact that we were the first ones to actually build a temple for the emperor. And, God, and Jesus calls that Satan's throne. And you can imagine what it would be like to be a church in the midst of a city that got their identity from worshiping the emperor like that. And so Jesus commends them for holding strong in their faith. But he also tells them, here's the warning. There is some who have began to follow one who he calls Balaam, which is a false teacher who has come into the church. And there's a group, I don't know if they're small or big, they seem to be small at this point, that have begun to follow this person. Now Balaam you may recognize as a reference to the Old Testament. Balaam was a spiritualist who uh, participated or kind of partnered with a Moabite king to seduce the Israelites into sexual immorality and idolatry to try to weaken the Israelites so that Moab could defeat the Israelites in battle. So if you can see that image, you can can kind of get an idea of what this person was doing and how he was stirring up problems in the church of Pergamum. The problem is that some of them had begun to follow him. And so Jesus says, repent, otherwise I will come to make war against the followers of Balaam. And then the invitation that he gives them is to receive hidden manna, a white stone with a new name. From the church of Pergamum, the church of Thyatira, Thyatira. So uh, Jesus says to them, he gives them the longest introduction, and he says to them that he is the son of God with eyes like flame and feet like burnished bronze, who searches the minds and hearts of all people. The fruit that he calls out is their works. And what's amazing about what happens with, the thir- with this church is that he's telling them, your faithful works have gotten even better and more faithful even as persecution has intensified around you. He calls out this great thing in them. But just like the church at Pergamum, there is a group who are following a false teacher among them. This time, Jesus identifies this person as Jezebel. Jezebel, from the Old Testament, was a woman who married into Israelite society by marrying an Israelite king. And as a result, she brought in a bunch of idolatry and worship from a god named Baal, who, uh, who's a pagan god, who she encouraged the Israelites to worship. And a part of that worship was sexual immorality, which was probably a part of Roman cultic worship as well. That's why Jesus draws the connections here. And he says to them, similar to Pergamum, repent, because I am coming to judge the children of Jezebel. And then finally, the invitation that they're given is the authority over nations to rule them. Now, the last of the yellow flag churches is really one that I might consider even an orange flag church. You'll see here in a minute. There's a little bit of yellow and red in here. But Jesus says to the church at Sardis, I am the one who has the seven spirits of God. In other words, the full measure of the Holy Spirit. And again, the seven stars, a reference to the protection of the churches. He says to them, the fruit I see in you is that there's a few of you who have not soiled your garments. In other words, there's a faithful remnant among you. We're not sure how many that is, but it's a few. It's not the majority, it's just a few. Because the warning he gives them is that you have a reputation of being a church that is alive, but in reality, I know that you're dead. Imagine that. 
The church of Sardis seems to be a church that for generations previous to them might have been a very faithful church. Previous to the current generation might have been a very faithful church. But the current generation seems to be trading on maybe the traditions or the faith of the previous generations. And in reality, their faith has seemed to have died. And Jesus says, wake up, strengthen what is alive, and repent. And the invitation he gives them, this is why I kind of think it's an orange flag church, because he basically gives them uh, uh, the gospel, an, an uh, an evangelistic message. He's basically telling them, come and receive white garments. Uh, Your name will be written in the book of life. These are salvation type things. In other words, implying you guys aren't even real believers. You're in the church. You're calling yourselves Christian. But in reality, you don't even have the white garments of salvation. But come to me and I will give those to you. We get to finish with two green flag churches, which which is really fun. The first one is the church at Smyrna. Jesus presents himself to the church at Smyrna as the first and last who was dead and came back to life, which I think is very important, a very, very appropriate way uh, to introduce himself, especially to the church at Sardis. Because get this, the church at Sardis was suffering under huge amounts of persecution and affliction. Jesus even says that there's poverty and the stuff that's going on as a result of the persecution that's happening to them. In other words, they were the people who opted not to participate in the Roman cult, and so they're probably poor as a result, right? They're probably barely holding it together as a result. Um, If you remember last week, if you were here, Pastor John talked about a story of a man named Polycarp. Polycarp, who had been, and, and in the story, Polycarp's being arrested and taken away because of his faith in Jesus. Well, Polycarp was a bishop at the church at Smyrna. And so if that gives you an idea of kind of what is going on at Smyrna and the kind of people that are there and what's happening to Polycarp and the persecution that they're facing, that's what's happening here. Now, in addition to facing just the regular persecution under the Roman Empire that all the churches were facing, Smyrna is actually facing additional persecution from a local group of non-Christian Jewish people whom Jesus says are the synagogue of Satan. So they're persecuting the Christians there in Smyrna as well. So Jesus comes to them. He doesn't give them a warning. He has nothing against them. Everything is good. But he gives them a challenge. Don't fear impending suffering and be faithful unto death. You know what this tells us? I think this is important to see is that Jesus doesn't come to them and say, look, I'm going to end your suffering. I see how it's going. You've been so faithful to this point, and so I'm going to put an end to anybody who's persecuting you and protect you. He says actually the opposite, right, in some ways. He says this, the suffering and persecution is going to get even worse. He says, but be faithful unto death even if it causes you your life because what I have given you is more valuable. I've given you the crown of life, and, I protect, and I'm protecting you from the second death, spiritual death, eternal death, which is really what counts. So the church of Smyrna to the church at Philadelphia. Our last church in the seven. Jesus comes to them as the holy one, the true one, the one who has the key of David, which is the key that opens the kingdom of God. And he says to them, look, I've seen your fruit. You've kept my word faithfully. You've not denied my name. And even though you have little power, much like the church at Smyrna, they have little power, they have little money, they have little material in, uh, wealth or influence in their city, probably because they are doing the same thing Smyrna does. They've remained faithful, and so as a result, they're being, uh, they're being persecuted, and all these things have been taken from them. But Jesus comes to them and he says, hold on to what you have and protect your crown of faithfulness. Imagine that. If you're somebody without power, you've got no money, you're, you're poor, you have no influence in your culture, and Jesus comes to you and says, you have a crown of faithfulness. Isn't that beautiful? And then he says to them at the end, I will publicly recognize you as the faithful and make you a pillar in the temple and in the city of God for eternity. There's a wonderful picture of that promise as well. Now look, as we come to the end of these, these messages of the church, churches of Revelation, the reality is there's a lot being said in these messages. I mean, each one of these could be its own sermon. We just did an overview of the seven churches. In fact, I would encourage you on your own to read through these chapters if you haven't done so or if you haven't done so recently. Read through them again this week to just kind of pick up on these ideas. But the question, of course, is, uh, the question of course for us as we're done, as we finish kind of reading through these is, um, what, uh, what does this have to say to the church today? How is this relevant to us? Right, and you may have been picking up on some of these things as we were reading them. Oh, this is how this is relevant. This is how that seems relevant to us, especially. 
The reality is, of course, it's all relevant, but let's begin here. I think what we see in this is it's important to see Jesus and who he is. There's a reason why each one of these messages start with a vision of who Jesus is or a picture of who Jesus is, a description of who Jesus is, and then ends with a promise of what Jesus has, what Jesus has given us in salvation, right? An invitation to the new creation reality. Because in both of these things, Jesus is challenging us and challenging the churches as well as comforting us as well, right? And, and here's how this strikes me. I think in the modern American church, we can agree that we're not facing the same kind of persecution that the churches of the first century were, right? I mean, compared to them, we've got it made. We may feel like we're marginalized at times because of our faith, but that's nothing compared to the persecution that they are facing in this case. However, I think, we, we, I think if we're honest, we face the same temptations to compromise that they did. The reality is that idolatry is a threat to all human hearts. We just may experience it in a little bit more of a subtle way. And here's the thing is that this is part of the danger where it's easy in, in, in cultures where it's easy to be a Christian and you don't have to face the persecution that they were facing is that at times... Right? That idolatry can creep into our hearts almost like an unseen cancer that can eat us from the inside out. In other words, when you're facing persecution like what these churches were facing, it's laid bare as far as your faith in Jesus. Like sooner or later, the rubber is going to hit the road in a very massive way. And you're going to have to decide between, do I want to continue to confess Jesus? Do I love Jesus more than I love my job? Do I love Jesus more than I love my freedom? Do I love Jesus more than I love my very life? That's the kinds of decisions and compromises that, the, that these churches were facing on a daily basis. Now, the reality for us is I think the danger is complacency with compromise. The danger is that if we're not vigilant about our own hearts, spiritual adultery and idolatry can creep in in all kinds of different ways. You know, we're, we're pretty good at, most of us are pretty good at identifying the sin and brokenness that's out there in the world, right? I mean... You can probably tell me where you believe the media is lying to you. You can probably tell me where you believe there is brokenness in our culture and sin and evil in the world that we look at around us. You can probably tell me the politicians and the policies that you disagree with for whatever reason. But the reality is that for the most part, we can be like that and then we can be so numb and blind to the brokenness and flaws in our own hearts. And yet that's exactly the most important thing that we're told to see in these messages. Look, these messages are not seven messages to the world. They're not seven messages to the Roman Empire. They're not seven messages to Caesar. They're seven messages to the churches. This is who Jesus is speaking to. And he's challenging us. And these words are a gift and a blessing to us if we'll take them the way they're supposed to be taken. As the prophet who speaks to us and challenges us for our good. And I think the only thing that's more amazing and even better, even a more amazing blessing than Jesus as prophet is Jesus as pastor. Because here's the thing, is that he comes to us in these messages. And if you read through these seven messages, that's the benefit of reading through all seven of them, by the way. You'll see there's a statement or a phrase that happens in all seven of these messages. He says to the church at, one, at, at, at a certain point in each message, to he who overcomes or to he who conquers, I will give this. And it's a, the invitation, the promise according to new creation. But here's the thing is that when Jesus makes that invitation and that promise, he's not saying <clears throat> to him who overcomes on his own strength or to him who conquers on his own strength. He is saying, essentially, look to the one who has already overcome on your behalf. Look to the one who has conquered death and sin and the grave on your behalf. It's an invitation to trust in what Jesus has already done. That's why these messages, more than anything, are about who Jesus is and what he has done. That's why it starts the way it does. That's why each message ends the way it does. Is he wants us to see that the one who is the ultimate overcomer and conqueror is Jesus himself. We're going to see that especially as we move forward into the book of Revelation. But before we do, let's pause. And I want to close this way. I've got a slide here with all of the promises that Jesus makes to the seven churches. And what I want you to see is that this is what Jesus has won for those who are in Christ as the one who is the ultimate overcomer. 
And as you're reading through that list, there may seem, seem like some of these may be a little bit cryptic. Don't worry, we're going to get to it as we go through the book. We'll see more and more of these images pop up, and we'll explain what, exactly what they mean when we get there. But I just want you to key in on these phrases. Allow these phrases to soak in a little bit. And maybe there's one or two phrases that jump out to you as especially important and especially um, poignant right now because of maybe something you're going through or facing or just an encouragement to you. And as we do, I want you just to remember this, is that these promises and these words are just as true for those who are in Christ as they were 2,000 years ago when they were first spoken to John on that island called Patmos. And so we're going to pray as we close. And as we do, I want you just to kind of think about what are one or two of these phrases that really speak to me and thank God for these or allow them just to kind of soak in to your soul. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful for all of these promises and even more that we see in your word. And Lord Jesus, we praise you as the one who is the great overcomer, who has overcome and conquered on our behalf. When we were helpless to do anything about our sin, Lord Jesus, you saved us. When we had no strength to provide for provision, Lord, you provided beyond what we can imagine. And Lord, we ask that as we consider these messages to the churches of Revelation, that we would understand the challenges that are here and that we would receive them as grace and mercy, as encouragement to live well. Even the commands to repent are an invitation to joy. Because as we repent, Lord, we turn from the things that bog us down. We turn from the things that break our hearts and break your hearts and break your heart. And Father, we move into your grace and mercy. That as we said earlier, is not just to, in, your words are not just to inform us, but to transform us. And we ask, Lord, that you would allow your living word by your spirit to transform us in those areas that need to be changed. Spirit, would you speak into the inner recesses of our hearts? to show us much like Jesus spoke to the things that were beneath the surface in the churches. And Lord, would you give us the faith to change what needs to be changed for our good and for your glory. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to continue worship with communion this morning, and the ushers are ready to serve you. And as they do, we would ask that you, or remind you to grab both cups because each cup has one of the elements in it for communion. And then Pastor Kim will be up here in a couple minutes to lead us all through taking communion together. Thank you.
in the upper room where Jesus instituted communion. They went up there to celebrate the Passover meal early afternoon, and they were there till late in the evening. A lot happened there. As a matter of fact, John chapter 13 through 17 is called the Upper Room Discourse, where Jesus instructed, he bathed their feet, he uh, told them all kinds of things that they needed to know. And of course, most importantly, as he had told them all along what was going to happen in the next few hours, but they couldn't really comprehend that. And so, uh, uh, of course, they were upset at the thought of that. So chapter 14 starts out, Jesus said, do not let your hearts be troubled. You know, that's good advice, especially in this day and age. Don't let your heart be troubled. Is there anything going on in the world or your life that could trouble your heart? Well, of course. But don't let it. We can turn to God. Don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. My Father's house are many rooms or mansions, as it says in the King James. If that were not so, I would have told. Would I have told you I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And then these immortal words, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He that no one comes to the Father except through me. No one comes to the Father except through Jesus Christ. So that's the context of communion. We take communion nearly 2,000 years later to remember what transpired so long ago. Chapter 14 finishes up where Jesus says, come, let us go. And everything that he had talked about for three and a half years was about to be fulfilled on the cross and what followed. But in that upper room at supper, when he picked up a loaf of bread, he broke it and he said, this is my body given for you. Let's eat together. Thank you, Lord. Thank you so much, Lord. He picked up a cup. He said, this cup is my blood of the covenant. My blood, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Let's drink together. As somebody once said, he died for me so I could live for him. Isn't it a blessing to take communion? Amen. Well, uh, now about the collection for the Lord's churches. Uh, Actually, that's the first line of 1 Corinthians 16. Paul says to the church, he says, now about the collection for the Lord's people. Do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum, a sum of money in keeping with your income. That's the simplicity of a giving. The purpose of giving, of course, is to promote the gospel one way or another. Uh, There are a number of ways to give, uh, in person, online, uh, uh, the boxes in the foyer. Uh, There's even snail mail. We accept snail mail. But the point is, is that we lay up and we give in proportion to our income for the work of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much. Father, for generous people, just pray, Lord. I pray a blessing, Lord, on gift that goes to the gospel, and the giver is for the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. Ushers.
That concludes our service today. Why don't you stand? And uh, before we dismiss, let me make mention of several things that will be of a blessing to you. Uh, fellows, uh, Tuesday morning is uh, men's breakfast, and it'll be on campus uh, starting now um, this season uh, in the Family Life Center, 7 a.m., a good time of fellowship and food and uh, a brief devotion, just a time to engage and be a blessing. So I encourage you to come 7 a.m. Uh, at the, in the Family Life Center. Also later in uh, the day, I think 9 o'clock, is the Ladies' Bible Study. I encourage you to come. What a blessing that is, a time of fellowship uh, based on the Word of God. And then Wednesday, uh, let me make mention, it's the second week of Oasis for this season. That's our noon lunch and Bible study in the Family Life Center, Wednesdays at noon. And uh, a great lunch is served, $5, just covers the cost. But let me say this about the lunch. I know that some people are on a dietary restrictions, and uh, I encourage you, uh, just bring your lunch. Because it's not, the purpose is not so much lunch as it is fellowship and a study of God's Word. So please uh, don't let uh, you know, dietary restriction keep you away. Just bring a lunch and come. My wife brings her own lunch because she has certain things she needs to be careful of. And so anyway, but the purpose is fellowship and Bible study. And then Fridays at noon, uh, the Zoom Bible study. All right. Father, I just praise you and thank you, Lord, for each person. I pray a blessing, Lord. I pray a blessing physically and emotionally in our hearts and spirits, Lord, that we go forward with a feeling of expectation for the day and age we live in and a heart to tell the good news of Jesus Christ to others. Bless now in Jesus' name, amen. Lord bless you.